This course is going to be the final course on advanced declarative programming. And I'm going to start by refreshing a little bit last week. I have an impression I went a little bit too fast last week. So I'll refresh you a little bit on the Lambda calculus. And there's two reasons why it's important. First of all, the Lambda calculus is inside all programming languages. This is important. Whenever you learn any language in the future or a language from the past, there's always a language calculus in the inside there. So if you understand this, you will understand a lot about how all languages work. And the second part is the lambda calculus is actually a form of programming called declarative programming, which has advantages. But real programming languages do more than lambda calculus. They will interact with the real world. But uh, lambda calculus defines a form of programming that has some big advantages. So we want to stay in that as much as possible. And then I'll talk about declarative paradigms. So I actually went a little bit too fast on that last week. I'll explain more about the three moments in the lifetime of variables and how that defines all the declarative paradigms. So when you learn a language later, or when you use cloud analytics, whatever, it's always going to be one of these. And then I'll talk a little more about advanced declarative algorithms. Last week, we talked about ephemeral cues. And this week, I'm going to show a little bit more advanced technique using laziness. That you can do persistent cues with worst case constant time. And finally, I talk about secure data abstraction, how it's possible to make it so you cannot cheat, you cannot look inside. So what do you need for that? So this also is used by all programming languages to, to protect the data abstractions. Let me give a first refresher on the lambda calculus. So this is something that was seen in the course AMFO 1104, but it's very important, and I understand that when you see it the first time, it's kind of hard to really understand the, the consequence. So I'm going to say a little bit more this time. I'll give you a quick refresher. So the lambda calculus is a simple model of computation. So it's a very simple language, which only has two things, function definition and function application. So a lambda term is defined very simply. It's either a variable or a lambda abstraction. So this is actually defining a function or it's actually a function application. So T1 is a function and T2 is the argument. So here I'm applying function with one argument. Here I'm creating a function with one argument x. And that's it. And this is called an abstraction. And this is called an application. So this seems very, very, very simple. It's extremely simple. But in fact, this model is Turing equivalent. You can write all programs in this. And this was known a long time ago by Alonzo Church, who defined the lambda calculus. And this was in the 1930s. OK, so this comes from the 1930s. He was a logician who was investigating computation. This was the period of the first computers. But they were very primitive, and you could not really program them in those days. But so Alonzo Church was a mathematician, logician. He defined this. So this is actually Turing equivalent. And you can encode everything, all data types, all control structures in here, in the lambda calculus. OK, so that's cute, right? That's kind of nice to see that you can make something so simple and have it be completely Turing equivalent. But it's actually much, much more than that. Uh, there's actually 
strong reasons why this is inside all programming languages. Let me just give a simple example of the encoding first. So let's say we encode true, false, and and. Let's say we want to do logical operations. You can encode other things too, like lists and while loops and so on, but I won't do that. So true, I can encode it as a function that returns of two arguments, x lambda x lambda y, returns the first argument. And false is a function that returns the second argument. And and is a function of two arguments, let me call them p and q, which does an application. So p and q are two arguments, but p is going to be a function of two arguments also. So the result of the and is p applied to arguments q and p. So this seems kind of weird, but you can actually do computation with this. If I now do and true, false, and I use the rules of the function applications, I can make some reductions, and this will actually give me the same thing as the false here. So with this, you can actually do all computations. So this is a simple example. You can encode everything. Okay, so that's kind of cute, huh? that, that's, that something so simple can really take the, the core of computation is in this. So any very complicated language, all the complexity is kind of arbitrary. It's all added for the comfort of the programmer, uh, data types, control structures, while loops, if statements, uh, uh, lists, numbers, but in fact, uh, the core is just this, function abstraction and function application. Okay? So why is this really more important? Why is this really a core thing? Well, that was, so th this was invented in the 1930s, okay, by Alonzo Church. But there was another guy called Peter Landon, and this was in 1965. You, this took 30 years, okay, realized that the lambda calculus is at the heart of all programming languages. But why is this? Well, it's not just because you can encode everything. It's because programming languages, languages do abstraction. So one of the key features of a programming language is abstraction. Now you know already this very well. So for example, an example of an abstraction is an object and a class. So an abstraction is a box with stuff inside and an interface that you can do operations. Operations, and here you have internal uh, the definition. And these operations obey rules. That means you can use the interface, rules of the interface, without knowing how the definition works. Okay, this can be very complicated code. It can be a million lines of code, and the operations can be very simple. So this is the key concept that makes big systems possible, okay? Otherwise, we would not be able to use computers in the world, in the world as we do today. Otherwise, we would not have internet and browsers and Google search and all that kind of stuff. Because with this, you can have layered systems, and you can divide the work. You can have teams building large systems. where each member of the team knows one part. So an operating system like in here has maybe 10, 20 million lines of code in there, huge number of libraries, thousands of years or more, tens, hundreds of thousands of man years of work in programming that. And it's possible because of this concept of abstraction. Okay, so how does this relate now to lambda calculus? With the lambda calculus, 
has function abstraction and application. And we saw this. This is called higher order programming. Higher order programming means that functions are first class. You can make them as arguments, return them as results, create them, and you do them, do any more things with them that you want. So the lambda calculus is only that, okay? It's higher order, and that's it. So it turns out that with higher order programming, you can define all abstractions. All abstractions are are forms of higher order programming. An object is actually a function. A class is also a function. A component, an abstract data type, a package, anything that you consider some form of abstraction is a form of higher order. So lambda calculus really is the language of abstraction. And abstraction is the key. All languages need this. If you don't have this, you cannot make big programs. Even very simple languages have this. Okay. Even assembly languages have abstraction, where you can define macros, for example, or procedure calls, and use them. So all programming languages have this, and the lambda calculus is basically the language of abstraction. So for that reason, it's at the core of all programming languages. And you can see it's a very simple core. Right? It's very, very simple, and very complicated languages you might get lost in their complexity, but don't have to worry. If the language is well designed, then you can see that. Lambda calculus is essentially higher order programming, and it's only higher order. It doesn't do anything else. Function, abstraction, application. But that's enough. With this, we can actually program code all abstractions. So this we saw in previous courses. You can encode objects, classes, abstract data types, packages, components, modules, whatever you want to call it, uh, agents. You can encode them all using higher order programming. Okay? So this is the key reason why language calculus is so important. It's the language of abstraction, and it's at the core of all programming languages. So that's the first reason. But there's actually a second, a second reason, which is connected to the first in a subtle way, which is called declarative programming. The second reason why lambda calculus is important. The second reason is declarative programming. So declarative programming basically means Programming only in the lambda calculus. Nothing more. Because practical languages, they extend the lambda calculus with features that are not part of the lambda calculus. Practical languages, they extend the lambda calculus. It's basically the reason why is because the practical languages interact with the real world. If you look at lambda calculus, I don't see any interaction with the real world here. I have only a, an expression that I reduce. So practical languages have to interact with the real world. So they need to extend the lambda calculus for that. For example, there are many, many possible extensions. For example, a hardware clock, very simple, a primitive that gives me the time. A hardware clock, like that clock, is actually not 
uh, a part of the lambda calculus. It's giving me the real world time. And each time I call the clock, it gives me the current time. That's not a concept that's in lambda calculus. Okay. But if you look, there are many other concepts. Even things like mutable state, where you can assign a variable multiple times, is not lambda calculus. And the reason is, if I assign the variable and I read the variable, I get the value. But if I read the variable later, I can get a different value if I did an assignment. That's not lambda calculus. In lambda calculus, the functions always give the same because the value of variable can change. Okay, and there are other things. Anytime you interact with the real world, the other kinds of interactions, you can see that it's not part of the lambda calculus. So they extend it. Okay. So fine, that's interesting, right? They extend the lambda calculus. But in fact, there's a good reason to stay. You want to stay in declarative programming as much as possible. You want to stay in the lambda calculus as much as possible. I want to stay in this little nice place as much as possible. And I don't want to rely on this kind of real world stuff because it kind of breaks all the properties of lambda calculus. Okay? And the reason is lambda calculus has strong properties. They are very useful for programming. And the main property is called confluence. So the main property of lambda calculus that makes it really useful for programming is called confluence, it's uh, proved in something called the Church-Rosser theorem, where you can prove it. It's not that simple to prove, actually, but you can prove it formally that for this calculus, the reduction of an expression, no matter in what order you do the reductions, it always gives the same result up to variable renaming. So reduction of an expression always gives the same result. Even if you do different reduction orders. And you can do you can see that. If I do comp simple computations like and and so on, you can choose which order you do the reductions. You can see that. But the result is always going to be the same up to variable renaming, because the variable names actually are not important. OK? So this is a very, very strong property. And this means that you, you want to keep this property in real programs. Okay? The more you keep this property, the more things, so this property, the more advantages you get. So let me just give a main list, a list of some of the advantages. There's these advantages in designing programs. Okay? There's advantages in testing. Okay, much easier. There's advantages in concurrency and distributed programming. So in designing programs, the property is called, we can call it referential transparency. This is a property that means you can replace equals by equals. If I have x is equal to f of y, and y is equal to g of z, then I can replace the y by g of z, and it gives the same result. 
I can replace equals by equals. I can replace an expression by another expression that's equal. Right? If y is equal to g of z, I can replace y by g of z and inversely. And I can always do that, and it does not change the result. So this means that many optimizations are easy. This means that I don't have to worry about calling a function too many times or only once. Uh, I can call it again if I need to or not call it again. And I can do optimizations where I replace computations by simpler, so on. So there's many things I can do because of this. Also, testing is very easy because a function is defined by its inputs and by its outputs. It has no internal memory, no internal memory. It's not like an object in Java. So a function is defined by its inputs and outputs. That means if you have a system with many functions, you can test each one of them separately. And you don't have to worry about the history. So there's no history. If I take a Java object and I call it, I can change the internal attributes. A mutable state, real world. But Lambda Calculus does not have that. So there's no internal memory. So functions are very easy to test. They can also be defined separately and tested separately. So testing is very easy. It's also much more efficient, the, the testing. And once you start building real programs, large distributed fault tolerant programs, you really see the advantages of this, okay? And a final advantage is concurrency, that you don't have race conditions. That means no non-determinism. Race condition is another word for non-determinism when the result can change when the reduction order changes. This is because of mutable state, where you define if you assign two variables and two threads, if I do in different orders, the result is different. Well, this kind of problem cannot happen in the lambda calculus. Okay. In the lambda calculus, we have confluence. So this is an enormous advantage for concurrent programming. Because if you've followed the course on proven concurrent programs, I think Charlotte Pescher has a course on that. You see, it's quite complicated. Okay. Well, this complexity goes away if you do lambda calculus. So the idea is you try as much as possible to write your program in a declarative substance, which corresponds to lambda calculus. Okay. So you can see the lambda calculus is really a key, a key thing in uh, programming. This one, I actually gave it a name. I called this concurrency for dummies. Because in the past, people didn't realize this. This was kind of forgotten, because people were mostly using languages with variables that you can assign, like Java, for example. So they kind of forgot this. It's funny, huh? how simple things can be forgotten. But now it's coming back because of, because of the cloud, essentially. The cloud is forcing people to use declarative paradigms because it doesn't work. It's too complicated if you don't do that. Okay? This simplicity really shows when you make big programs. And it's completely practical. And don't let anyone say that, that it's not. You can have very old timer guys, huh? not me, but other old timer guys, who are who grew up, for example, in Java, who do not see this. Don't listen to those guys. Okay, they're wrong. In fact, even Lambda, even uh, Java now has Lambda expressions. Okay, they really, it's very strong. The pressure for declarative programming is very strong. Okay. Okay, so that's it for refresher Lambda. Let me stop there. That gives you. 
the main motivation. Okay, you see why lambda is important. The two reasons why. First reason it's at the core of all languages because of abstraction. The second reason is because that it has very strong properties that you want to take advantage of. Okay. Okay, very good. So that refreshes you, I hope, gives you a, a big picture of lambda calculus. Please take a look at the slides in the previous course or look up lambda calculus on Wikipedia if you want more information. If you have, if you're kind of, uh, if you have questions or some things are not so clear, there's a huge amount of information on this. Huh? This is a very fundamental thing. Let's take a look now at these declarative paradigms. So a declarative paradigm is basically a language, is a language that corresponds to lambda calculus. Huh? So declarative means that it's actually, in some sense, it's doing lambda. There are ways of making the lambda easier to use for programmers like data flow and so on, and adding data types. But that doesn't change the properties. If it's doing lambda calculus, then we call it declarative. Okay. So let me now try to classify all declarative paradigms, as far as we know now. So in order to classify them, we have to see how, what are the different ways you can do computing and still do lambda. Okay, so the first point is that there are three special moments in the lifetime of a variable. And this, and with this we'll do the classification. So one, this so in lambda, one we can define it, define the variable. Two, we define the function that gives its value. So hit x for example, and here we have f of y, where x will be equal to f of y, but we still don't execute it, we only define it. And three, we evaluate the function and bind the variable. These three moments can be done separately or together. And this is how you can classify the paradigms. So let me do some classification here. Make a table. So this is a table of declarative paradigms. And we're going to define this table according to these three moments. Okay. So the first, the simplest bit one is where all three are together. Okay. One two, three, they're together. They're all done together. That means I define the variable and I compute its value at the same time. Huh? I do something like x is equal to uh, 10 plus 10. I immediately compute it. So I don't have unbound variables. I don't have lazy suspensions. I do all three together. Okay. So this is sequential, this is called sequential functional programming. So all three of them are together. This is eager. Eager means that you evaluate the function at right away when you define it. All three together. Okay, and there's many languages that do this. Most languages do this. So in terms of functional languages, you can say Scheme or ML will do like that. Okay. Not Java, because Java is not a lambda, it's not a functional language. 
We're looking at languages that are doing lambda here, right? So this is the first one, and it basically merges all three, does them all at the same time. There's no add band variables, there's no lazy suspensions. If, you, if I now do a slightly different one, where I define the variable and its function at the same time, but I don't evaluate it until I need it. That's called lazy evaluation. We saw that, huh? This is lazy functional programming. There are languages that do this. The most famous language that does this is called Haskell. There's a large community of people doing Haskell. They're very, very uh, proud and, uh, and very mathematical. So this is a very powerful, strong community of programming people. So you can look at this language. But in this language, the defining and the variable and the function is done immediately. There's no unbound variables, okay? But the evaluation is done later. And that gives me this one. So this is the, uh, a sequential paradigm. I say it has values. Values are constants. Values are not unbound. One, two, three, the list, five, six, seven. So this is sequential programming with values. Actually, Haskell is not, the functional part of Haskell is not concurrent, because this is actually doing coroutine. Now, now let's separate number one. Let's make number one separate, okay? So one is separate, two, three. So here we have sequential with, where you can have unbound variables. Let me call them data flow variables, which can be unbound. So here, number one, the defining variable is separate from the function and evaluating the function, okay? So this is the declarative subset. So this is chapter two in the course book, okay? This is, so this is basically sequential functional programming, but with unbound variables added, okay? There's also a language called Prolab, which is logic programming, but only the deterministic subset. Because Prolab has, un has these variables, has unbound, which they call logic variables, okay? But it's only the deterministic subset. And this has some advantages, like you can do tail recursive list and so on, okay? Now let's go farther. Let's separate everything. One, two, and three, all separate. Boom. So we define a variable, we define the function, and later on, we can evaluate the function when we need it. Okay, so this is lazy functional with data flow. Actually, this paradigm doesn't really work because, because it has to be concurrent. Okay, so this one is kind of unused. Let me make them now concurrent. Let me add threads. So wait up, what I'm doing now is adding threads. So threads is still lambda. Threads, what threads mean is that I have some control over the reductions. In the big lambda expression, I have control. I say I do this, I do this. So threads tell me that I We'll do the reductions in some nice way, fair way. So thread, the thread is control over reduction order. So it's still lambda, and because of Church-Rosser, this does not change the result. Okay, result not changed. Because of the confluence property, huh? The result of the computation doesn't depend on the threads. But if we add threads now, here this model 
where we have one and two, three are together. This is what we called deterministic data flow. And if we add laziness, this is what we call lazy deterministic data flow. One, two, three, all separate. Okay? So this one is what I called concurrency for dummies. The MapReduce model is doing this because it's actually doing data flow and it's concurrent. The MapReduce computations are done on other nodes and the, the main computation waits for the results. So there's a data flow synchronization and the whole thing is concurrent. And because it's functional, it's still confluent. So this is here. This one, the lazy deterministic data flow, you can actually extend the cloud models to this. This is the most general one. This is really a very nice one. Okay. This one is not used so much yet, even though it's extremely powerful, uh, because for historical reasons, but more and more. So cloud tools are basically moving to there, to here. So the laziness is very important. Uh, this is also called push versus pull model. Uh, a push model is eager when I have inputs, I do the computation. So I push from input to output. Whereas a pull model is when I need the output, I do the computation. So I'm pulling the inputs to the output. So the control is at the output in the pull model, and the control is at the input in the push model. So this pull model is getting more and more success now. So everything is going towards this model. Okay. So this one is the future model. This one is the great one that you will see more and more in the future. Now, now let me show you some more advanced declarative algorithms. So we have powerful concepts. We have data flow variables and we have lazy suspensions. With this, we can actually make very efficient algorithms that are still declarative. So, and it's kind of subtle, that's why I want to explain it. So basically, we want to stay, stay inside the declarative paradigms as much as possible. And we want efficiency, of course, efficient algorithms. want both of these goals. And we use the powerful concepts that we have in the declarative paradigms. And there's basically two of them. Well, of course, there's also higher order. But there's two new ones, which is data flow variables and lazy suspensions. So with these two concepts, with these two, we can actually make very surprisingly, this is actually very powerful, very efficient algorithms that people before didn't think it was possible. People thought you need mutable states, but you don't with these concepts if you're smart. So there's a very interesting book which is called Purely Functional Data Structures. So if you're interested in this, and you're interested in the power of laziness, if you're intrigued by this, and actually if there's still research going on, then I recommend this book. This is a book called Purely Functional Data Structures. By Chris Okasaki. This, so this is not part of the course. It's not the syllabus for this course. But the examples that I give, I will give some, some of the examples will be actually taken from this book. Okay? But 
the book goes much farther. It does, has many very clever and smart ideas. So if you want to, you can actually take a look at it. I can pass it around. Thanks. So let me explain it now. Let me give a little bit of summary. A summary. And then I promise, then we will make a break. And after the break, I will write code again. Okay, we go away from all the philosophy and we go to some code. So the summary of the advanced declarative algorithms. So it depends on the paradigm. If we have sequential functional programming, we can make, as we saw last week, an amortized ephemeral cube. So amortized means, as we saw explained also last week, that sometimes the operations are slow, but if you take do many operations, then then the average time is fast. Okay? Now if we add data flow variables, we can do better. We can do worst case ephemeral Q. Which means that all operations are constant time. And we saw this is what we saw last week. So ephemeral here means that you only have one version of the data structure. That means if I have a queue and I do an operation, then I, I'm not allowed to use the old queue is not available anymore. This is what most of the time, this is very common, okay? Most data structures that you use will be ephemeral. Okay? Now, today I want to go even farther than this. I want to go to lazy deterministic data flow. So here we add data flow, the lazy suspensions. Huh? We add lazy suspensions and we can do better then. We can do amortized and worst case persistent Q. This means that we can have many versions. So this means that if I have a queue and I do an insert, I get another queue. But I can take the original queue and do another insert, and that gives me a third one. And I can have multiple versions in the system. And this can be important for collaborative, for applications when you have many, uh, you need to keep track of many variations. So for example, a system like GitHub, where you have repositories, you can have many versions of these repositories at the same time. So if you want to program something like this extremely efficiently, you can do it in the declarative model by using lazy suspensions. Okay? So these two, the ephemeral cues, we saw them last week. But this one I want to see today. Okay. This one we're going to see after the break. So after the break, I'm going to do some smart programming with lazy suspensions. And you will, if you, when you understand this, you will become gurus in lazy programming. This is really the most uh, clever way of using the power of laziness. And it's such a simple idea. Okay? In our model, all we needed to do was add weight needed. One small concept we add, and the result is we can do very sophisticated data structure, and it's still declarative. We're still inside the lambda, the place where we want to stay as much as possible. Let me now do some algorithm design. So we're going to start with the algorithm we did last week, which is the code. Let me do we can show you the code here. So this is, you can see now the code that we saw last week. You can see we have a queue, 
which represent as tuple with two lists. You can do insert and delete. So the queue is represented as a list. One is list is the front of the queue and the back of the queue, but reversed. So when we insert elements, we put them in the back here. Okay, and when we delete elements, we take them out of the front. So that's very fast, right? The only problem is that the F is sometimes empty. So we have this check function here that when F is empty, it basically moves F into R into F by reversing it, okay? By reversing it. So you can see that the insert and delete is basically constant time, except that sometimes we have to move elements from R to F because otherwise we can't do deletes. And that's what makes it amortized. You see how it works, huh? So that's the amortized. So let's try to do a little bit smarter than that. So let me go back now to the, to the board here. So we have this amortized ephemeral queue, which uses this data structure, FR, which basically this is represents the queue. So the queue is the same as append. The value of the queue is append f reverse r. This is the content of the queue. This will be that. And when we insert, we put it here. We add it to r. And delete is we remove it to from f. So these are constant time, except that sometimes we have to move elements from r to f, because when f gets empty, you can't do delete anymore. So this is what makes it amortized. That we have to sometimes do this step. Okay? So we want to make this one persistent. We want to make it amortized persistent cube. That's the first step. And after that, we make, we'll make it worst case persistent. So, let me first explain what it means to be ephemeral and to be persistent. Let me give you a better definition of that. So you can see the new thing that you get when you have, sorry, when you have a persistent thing. The new property that you get, which is actually very strong. You can have multiple versions. And this is something that's normally very hard to do. In a language like Java, it's very hard, because the only way is to copy the whole thing. But let me explain first what is ephemeral versus persistent. So many data structures are ephemeral, but sometimes you need them to be persistent. Let me explain. So an ephemeral data structure, let's say you have a queue. It has a value, Q1. I do an insert operation, and I get a new queue. Okay. And I can do then delete and whatever, and I can keep going. But at any time, there's only one version. So when I do an insert on Q1, given Q2, I'm not allowed to use Q1 anymore. So this is very normal. Huh? Most data structures with mutable states are going to be ephemeral. But let's say I want multiple versions. Like in GitHub, where you have multiple repositories, I can make a clone of a repository, I can do operations, somebody else can get another, can make another version, okay? So you can have many versions. So here, for example, if I have Q1 and I do an insert, I get Q2. But let's say I take Q1 and I do another insert. I get Q2 prime, okay? And now I can keep doing operations. And here I have two versions. Now I have two versions existing at the same time, okay? At the same time I have these two versions and they're both coming from Q1. If you write the queue in Java, this is not possible in an easy way. You have to copy the whole queue, which is expensive, okay? So we want to do this efficiently. Now, 
the ephemeral amortized cube that we did here is not going to be efficient when we use it persistent way. Uh, so this uh, amortized ephemeral cube is actually not an amortized persistent cube. You can take the code we did before and use it in this persistent way, but it's not going to be efficient. Because assume that you have here an, uh, an, an, an order n operation, a check operation when you do a delete. Huh? And here also an order n operation. If I have another version, q2 prime, maybe I get order n. So you can see I have now three operations, four operations, and three order n. So it's not amortized anymore. That means because I can do these order n operations in the different versions, you see? So this is not amortized anymore. So this, this version, this code, so the previous code, is not going to work because it doesn't have the amortized complexity. In fact, it's much worse complexity. So how do we do? How do we make it better? Okay. Well, the trick is do the reverse in a lazy suspension. This is actually a good idea. Yeah. You do the reverse in a lazy suspension, and when you need you need it, then it's evaluated. Okay? This is good. But the, the problem is uh, that you have to create the lazy suspension in advance. Okay, so the, the advantage of this is that same, the same computation works for all versions. Okay, the same, I create the lazy suspension here, and if I do the lazy suspension in here, the result will be also visible here and here. So I only have to do it once instead of many, many times. The, name, the same computation works for all versions. But the problem is you have to create it in advance. We have to create the lazy suspension in advance. We have to create it before we do the split here. So we have to somehow know the lazy suspension, the creation in advance. Okay, so that's the, the problem. How do you create it in advance? So here's the trick, and then I'll show you the code. The trick is we'll do a little bit more. Instead of doing the Q, instead of doing the Q with F and R, we make it a little bit smarter. Okay, we have, we now have a, we make it a tuple of four elements, the length of F, F, length of R, R. So we still have these two lists, F and R, and we still have to move elements from R to F, okay? But now we want to create this in advance. So in order to create in advance, we keep track of the length. This can be done very efficiently, yeah? The length. We don't want to compute the length of f by traversing the list, huh? So we keep the length in the tuple, and whenever we add an element to, to r, we increase length r, and whenever we remove an element from f, we remove one from length f. We keep track of the lengths. Okay? So, So we have to create the reverse, create the lazy suspension in advance. Basically, the idea is that you create it in advance, and then several steps later, it's computed. 
Okay. But it's still reverse, huh? The lazy suspension is going to do reverse. And reverse is expensive. Remember, it's monolithic, yeah? So between the creation and the evaluation, we have some steps. These steps have to pay for the reverse. So basically, this is how monolith, this is how amortized computation works. The reverse is very expensive. Uh, so we don't want to do them very often. So the trick is that we, we create the lazy suspension first, uh, which is very efficient. It's not doing the reverse yet. And then we, some steps later, we actually do it. And the number of steps will be big enough that it pays back for the reverse. You see that? If the reverse has reverse of n elements, then in amortized, we can only do one reverse every n steps. So one trick is that you ha it's like it's called the banker, the banker approach to amortized algorithms. The banker approach means that I need to buy a house which is very expensive. Well, every month I put a small amount of money in the bank, and when I have all the money, I buy the house. Okay? So the amortized, the average price of the house is very small, even though it's expensive. So this is like that. Reverse is like buying a house. It's very expensive. Okay. So you need to do lots of monthly payments to pay for that expensive operation. So this is the banker approach to amortized algorithms. I don't know if in another course you actually saw techniques for building amortized algorithms. Did you see any techniques? If, they, if someone asks you to make an amortized algorithm, how do you do it? Have you seen that in a previous course? No. Well, then you'll see it here. Okay? You've seen amortized algorithms. You know what it is. Right? Okay? But how do you make an amortized algorithm? Well, amortized, it's like uh, real life. How do I buy a car which is costing 20,000 euros when I don't have 20,000 euros? Well, I make a loan and then I pay back. So amortized, it's amortized over a certain time. So here, I'm going to do the same. I, I do this reverse, which is very expensive. But by the time I do the reverse, I want to have enough money in the bank that I can pay for it. You see how that works? So I create the reverse in advance. And then every time I do a step in the, in the, in the queue, I'm paying for the reverse. Okay? And then when I actually do the reverse, I have to do it only when I have enough steps. You see how to, the idea how it works? This is called the banker's approach to building amortized algorithms. So this is what I'm going to do here. I want to create this reverse in uh, advance. It's a lazy suspension, huh? But then, eventually, I want to do the reverse. But I only want to do it when I have enough money in the bank. OK? So we create. So how do we do that? So here, let me show you now how we would do that. So remember, in the previous in the previous code, we have this check function that moves elements, moves elements from R to F. We keep this function, okay? We'll keep this function. And instead of doing, so the, in the previous case, we had the following code. The new Q would be Q of reverse R nil. Uh, so we get Q from nil. We go from Q nil R. So this is in the previous case. When the F is empty, we do reverse R and we, move and we make it the new F. 
Okay. And now we do something similar to that. We have Q len F, okay, F len R, R. Okay, now we want to move R to F. But we're not moving it when F is empty. We move it, we can move it anytime now. When, so we have len F, F. And we move, we want to move R. So that means we get this. We get len F plus len R. Okay, so since we moved R into F, we have now, instead of F, we have an append of F with, with basically the reverse of R. Okay, like this. Let me write it like this for now because we're going to make it lazy. And then the length of R becomes zero and R becomes nil. So you see how we're doing it now? Let me make different colors. So we want to move R into F. So the new R is going to be empty. Okay, and this here on the left is the new F. So the length is going to be length of f plus length of r. Okay, you see that. But the, the value of s is going to be the append of f with the reverse of r. Okay, but we're going to make this lazy. It's a lazy append. So it's going to be a lazy call. Let me show you what the call looks like. It's append of f with We're going to put the reverse inside a lazy suspension to make the whole thing lazy. That means the reverse is not executed right away. Okay. So the append of F and reverse R. But we put the reverse R in a lazy suspension because we don't want to execute the reverse right away. Now the reverse is monolithic, but we don't want to execute it right away here. We want to execute it later when we have paid for it. Okay. So we do this step here. We move R into F, and then we do a few steps, and then boom, we do the lazy huh? with the banker's approach. So with this, we do it in advance. Huh? And then after a certain number of steps, we do that. Okay, so let me show you now the code for this, then I'll explain how it works. So let me go back now to the code. So let me make the code as a modification of the previous example. So let me take this previous example and we modify it now. This is going to be the amortized persistent Q. Okay. So we now let me update this. So it's going to be it's going to use this new tuple with four elements. That means the initial Q is going to be zero, nil, zero, nil. And then there's going to be insert operation. The insert is len f len r and we also len f len r okay so the insert is going to do very straightforward it's going to put the the, the x also with the r which means that len f stays the same and len r is plus one. Okay, that's that's pretty straightforward, right? You see the insert is almost the same as before. Okay, and the delete also is going to be very similar as before. So again, we're going to remove the x from f, and we're going to let me look at this in a. So the, the 
len f is going to be the minus 1, f1, and len r is going to be the same. So you see, insert and delete are pretty simple, right? I'm just updating the l, the lengths. But the trick is in check, of course, huh? The trick is here in the check. So let me now do the check. So it's not, I'm not doing a check on nil. I'm doing a check on len f, f, len r, r, okay? And I have some condition here. Magic condition, I won't say it yet. Then, okay. Here, instead of doing reverse, I will do the cover that I showed you. Or I do len f plus len r. I do a lazy and f here. And then, and here I will do now a, this is an interesting, so this is the, I'm creating a lazy suspension for the reverse. I'm calling it. But of course, it will not execute yet. Huh? So all the reason is I want to do the. I want to do the reverse later. Okay. So this, you see this tricky use of laziness now. So, you see what I'm doing here. I, if some condition is satisfied, so I want to do things in advance, then I will move R to F. But I do lazy. So that means that I have from I go from len f to len f plus len r, like this. The new r is going to be zero. And here I will do an append of reverse r. Append because the old value of f is not nil, huh? So I append the old value of f with reverse r. But all in a lazy suspension, because I don't want to execute right away. I don't want to execute this right away. It will be executed later. Okay. It will be executed when uh, when I need the value of f and there's nothing there. Then it will be executed. Okay. So you see this. We just have to figure out what the magic condition is now. Okay. So what's this magic condition? Okay, so we need to pay for the reverse. So the problem here is that the, L, the lazy append is very efficient. It's going to do, uh, whenever I need an element from f, it will do one iteration. It's not monolithic, yeah? it's incremental. But the lazy reverse there is actually monolithic. When I do the reverse, I'm going to pay big time. I'm going to do the whole reverse. So I want to do the reverse only after some time. So how do I do that? Well, the trick is I'm going to make the, the elements of f pay for the reverse of r. So the r has a certain length, n. And when I do reverse, I have to do order n operations. Okay. So that means the banker's method says I have to have n euros in the bank when I do that. And how do I get n euros in the bank? Well, the f will pay. Okay, the f's. I'm doing operations on f. Okay. So the check function will do. So when do I do it? Okay. Okay, it's a little bit subtle. Let me put in the condition here. Then I'll explain how it works. It's a very simple condition. If the length of f is less than the length of r, then I create the lazy suspension. So how does that work? Well, 
It's basically doing things in advance. Huh? So let me explain. So basically, the idea is let me make. Uh, I have to write it down. I'm sorry. I have to go back to the board. Here. So let me explain now how I do this thing in advance, the banker approach. So the idea is that R is big and reverse R is expensive. Okay. So the idea is to make F pay for R. But R has n operation, n elements. That means we have to have F also have n elements. Okay? So the idea is, if you look at the, the, the code, let me go back to the code here. If you look, the insert will increase R, okay, and the delete will decrease F. So basically, we want R and F to be approximately the same size. Let me write it like this. Let me write it on the board. We want to make this work. So the, let me write it here. When do we do the check? The lazy. When do we create the lazy appendix? You have to do it in advance. Banker method. Okay. So that so that we pay for the reverse. Okay? So basically we make F pay for R. So when the size of F is approximately equal to the size of R then f is big enough. Okay? When I have length of f less than length of r, then in fact what happens is that r is just one bigger than f. And the reason is that insert and delete is always changing r and f by one. Okay? So as soon as r becomes one bigger than f, then we create this lazy suspension. Okay? And at that point, R and F are about the same size, so that means when we start deleting elements from F, we're paying back the R. You see, because R and F are about the same. Okay, let me just make it like that. Okay, and now we can run this thing. That's an easier pen, right? Let me correct there. X, S, X, X, R. Okay. Yeah, of course, since I'm using an easier pen, I have to define it. Okay, now we can do this. Now we can define a Q. Let me make some Qs here. So Q1 is going to be a new is going to be insert new q. Let me 
add an element to little a. Okay. element. So um, okay, and I have actually already done a lazy I've done a lazy uh, moving to F. Huh? You see that there's one element in F here on the one, but it's underscore. So that's a lazy suspension. It's not there yet. Now, if I do Q2 is equal to delete Q1, and I remove it inside of X, then I actually will do the lazy execution. You see it there? Or else X gives me A. OK? So basically, you can see it has exactly the same API as before. So, and it's going to do these lazy moves from R to F, okay? Okay, so let me now do one last step. So I, as I recommend you try this code out, huh? okay? Let me now go back to the board and now do the final step. So in this amortized persistent queue, we have this monolithic reverse. Okay? Can we get rid of that? Reverse is a pain. Now we're going to be very even more clever here. So in this uh, amortized persistent queue, we have this we have this reverse R. It's still monolithic. That's a pain. That's still a pain. So that's why it's still amortized. Okay. Can we get rid of it? Can we get rid of it? And we have it, it's like this. Huh? We have this code here, L append of F and lazy function, reverse R end. Okay, so what we have is this. We have a lazy append, and we have also this lazy suspension doing reverse. And basically this is doing, this is doing the same as what we did before. It's doing the append of F and reverse R. Okay? But it's doing it at the right time because it's lazy. We create lazy suspension and we do it. So we have the trickiness of lazy. But the problem is this reverse is still monolithic. This reverse is still very expensive. Can we get rid of it? And the trick is yes, there is a way of getting rid of it. Basically, basically we combine combine the append and the reverse. The idea is to write a new function that will do combine the append and reverse. Whenever it does one step of append, it will do one step of reverse.
which will combine the append and the reverse. That means each time it does one step of the append, it will also do one step of the reverse. So we make the reverse incremental by merging it with the append. Okay. So let me show you how it works in terms of the code. So here's the reverse. I'll do it, let me do it with an accumulator. Okay. Let's say we have a fun reverse R A case R of nil, then A otherwise, then reverse R to X A N. Okay? So this is the reverse, and it's monolithic, because the only way to get the first element is to go all the way to the end. But you can see it's doing step by step. It's taking one element out of R and putting it on A. Now let me show the lazy append. And then we'll see how we can combine them. Let me write it like this. If f of nil, then b. Otherwise, x f two, then l append f two b. This is just a lazy append. It's very simple. So you see how this is working. I'm traversing down f, and I'm putting the x's here. But here I'm traversing down R, and I'm putting the X's here. Now what I want to do is I want to merge these two functions and make the reverse part of the append. Use another color here. Okay. So this one will traverse F and return B. Okay, that's the lazy append. But we don't want it to return B. We want it to return B with the reverse of, of uh, R in front of it. Okay. So let me make a, a change here. So instead of B here, we want to put another element in front of B. Okay. Let me see the best way to maybe write it here on the left. So we want to do like this now. So now we're going to combine these two. Lazy L app rev. So we have all three arguments now. We have F and R, and then there's a result. F, R, and the result, I will call it B. So now we will keep all three arguments, F and R, and the result is B. Okay? So now we will take an element from F and an element from R. Do like this x x f two y r two then so here that the the reverse takes one element from r okay the append takes one element from f here we take an element from r and an element from f okay. Let me do the 
this part first. So you see how we're combining the two now? Let me make colors. Here, the, the, we take an element from F here, and this is part of the append. You see that? The F is doing the append. We take R, we take an element from R, and the R is doing the reverse. So we're doing the append, this is the append here, right? and the reverse in one function. See that? It's clever, no? Isn't that clever? Of course, we have to finish it. So R is always going to be a little bit bigger than F. F can be smaller, so at the very end, we will have a pair with nil, okay, and the last element here, and this will return R Y B. Okay. So instead of going having one function that goes down R and another function that goes down F, we make a single function that goes down both F and R. And this function is incremental. So each time we do a, a step of the lazy append, we're also doing a step of the reverse. So that means we essentially make the reverse incremental by piggybacking it on the append. OK? Isn't that clever? Tell me it's clever. Where these two are basically merged together. And it works because the length of F and R is very is much similar. So, so F is always going to be one element less than R because they're always increasing by one. Huh? And the condition for doing the check is that R is bigger than F, but there'll always be one bigger. Okay? So we know for sure that R is just one bigger than F. So that means at the end, we know that when f is nil, r will have one element in there. Okay. This is an example of a sophisticated algorithm design using declarative programming. Yeah? It's clever, right? You admit it's clever? It's, it's nice, huh? Isn't it? And because of this, we will have a worst case persistent Q. So now I can write the code for this. So I go back to the code. Basically, let me copy this whole bit and put it down here. So this will be the worst case for system Q. We have to define this lazy apply append reverse function. Huh? This is a new helper function that we've defined. We've invented it. It's basically combining the append and the reverse. Huh? FRG. Here we have our case statement. So we take the F and the R together and we remove an element from each of them. One from F and one from R. Oh, that's right. Uh, I don't want to make a bug because I want to demonstrate it's working. So I'm writing L up rev F2 R2 Y B. So here's where it's doing both, where it's doing one step for the append and one step for the reverse. Okay. And now we have the end where we have no y, like this, and then the result is just y, b, okay? And that's the lazy app rev, and that replaces this whole uh, thing here. This will be l app rev, f, r, no, I think that's right, then. Make sure here. So this, so the final 
function, the check function is actually pretty simple. Huh? It's lazy up, append reverse. It's done at the right time, basically when r is equal to f plus 1. And it uses this merged function here. Okay? running exactly the same as before, huh? except now that it's completely incremental, so that the code will be worst case. So I do this, browse Q1, so it's the same as before, and this, and the delete will work the same as before. So basically, it's doing exactly the same as before, except that the reverse is somehow merged inside the append so that, that the whole thing is worst case persistent efficient. Okay? Okay, so this is an example of real declarative programming. Okay? This is not a toy example, this is a real example, and you can use it for many more sophisticated data structures and queues. The same approach. So this approach of merging monolithic functions into incremental, to make them incremental, is very common and it works a lot, many times. Okay? So with this, we have a worst case persistent queue. And the code is there. Let me show, let me show you the link. So the whole code at once. A little bit smaller. I want to show, want to show the whole code. So here we can see now the lazy append reverse and the definition of the queue. So the code is very small, you see? It's very compact, but it's very smart. And understanding how this piece of code works is not completely trivial. Uh, I think you agree with me on that. It's very really clever. Huh? <coughs> okay. Okay. So let me stop there. So this gives you an example of really uh, sophisticated, advanced declarative algorithms. So, so the reason why we do all this effort uh, is because the whole thing is still declarative. So if we want to run this program concurrently, or if we want to do testing, or if we want to have a big program that uses these techniques, all the advantages of declarative are kept here. That's the reason why we want to do like this. Huh? This is still a pure declarative program and extremely efficient. So you can see, when people tell you, if people tell you that declarative programs are slow, it's not true. It means they don't know what they're talking about, okay? So, but you have to be smart. But these techniques, they exist. Huh? You can take a, a look at the code. So this book, for example, gives you many examples of the similar kinds of techniques. Huh? OK, so let me stop there. So thank you very much. So I hope you appreciate this beautiful code I'm showing you. Huh? And that you do some effort to understand really how it works.